Hi, and welcome to Codex. Our speaker today is Clayton Schunkweiler, who is an associate professor at Colorado State University. Professor Schunkweiler studies differential geometry and geometric probability with applications to polygonal spaces and frame theory. Today, he will tell us about a Lee algebraic perspective on frame theory. Take it away, Clay. Cool, thank you, Emily. Um, it's weird that you're doing this introduction like on the floor below me. It's <laughs> weird, but anyway. Uh, yeah, so thank you um, to all of the organizers for inviting me. Uh, let me, uh, if you want to follow along or just you know, take a sneak peek at what's to come in the slides. I just put a link in the chat. You can also see the URL on um, the screen. So yeah, so this is like, I don't know, uh, maybe a, a story of my own like lack of being well-read. Um, but I, I want to share with you some things that I learned fairly recently about how frame theory connects to some pretty basic um, Lee theory stuff. Um, and it seems, I mean, I, I'm going to talk about a particular application, but it seems like more broadly applicable. And uh, I'm, I'm sure some people already know a lot of this stuff, but um, it seems likely that some people don't. And so I, I just sort of want to tell you the story. Um, so first off, I should just mention that um, all of what I'm talking about is joint work with Tom Needham. Uh, I just love this picture of Tom and looking fancy. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so funded by NSF and Simons. Um, okay, so first of all, like the, the, the objects of interest here are going to be finite frames. Um, so usually like in a frame theory talk, the first thing you see is like, well, the definition of a frame is like, it's a collection of vectors and some Hilbert space that satisfies some inequalities and blah, blah, blah. Um, all I'm ever gonna be talking about are finite frames. So this is gonna be a finite list of vectors in a finite dimensional Hilbert space, in which case the, all the inequality mumbo jumbo is just saying that your collection of vectors is a spanning set. Um, so for me, we're just talking about spanning sets of, of you know, finite lists of vectors. And to start off with R to the D or C to the D. Um, so you can see a couple of pictures of um, spanning sets. Um, and then, um, you know, given a collection of these vectors, while really by putting subscripts on them, I've made it sort of an ordered list. Um, and then once I've chosen an ordering, I can make these things the, the columns of a matrix, um, you know, as Dustin always says, a short fat matrix. Um, and then, so here D is gonna be less than N. Um, and the um, given, you know, a frame, you have this associated operator called the frame operator, which in terms of the matrix is just F times it's either transpose or conjugate transpose, depending on whether you're working with real or complex things. Um, and um, I'm just, uh, I, you know, in practice, we're often interested in a situation where we, for example, choose this frame operator to be the identity or maybe a multiple of the identity. So when it's the identity, you have what's called a parseval frame. When it's a multiple of the identity, you have what's called a tight frame. Um, but even more generally, maybe we, we, you know, you wanna fix the frame operator or maybe just the spectrum of the frame operator because like, in your noise model, like it's not white noise. And so like, you shouldn't really choose a multiple of the identity. You should choose, you know, something that's, that's related to the, the covariance of your noise or, or whatever. Um, so I'm, I'm just gonna sort of, for the purpose of this talk, take it on faith that we are sometimes interested in frames where we've specified um, really the spectrum of the frame operator um, and or the norms of the vector. And so, you know, the, the, the most sort of standard example of this is when you choose, say, the norms of the vectors to all be equal to one, and you choose the frame operator to be a multiple of the identity, um, and it, like, which multiple it is, is it's going to be n over d times um, the identity matrix. Um, and of course, like, a multiple of the identity is uniquely determined by its spectrum. Um, so in the case of unit norm type frames, you have unit norm vectors. And the frame operator is a, is a multiple of the identity, so it's a tight frame. Um, and you know those, those things are, are a particular case where you you've specified these ve these frames that we like based on you know um, frame you know the vector norm information and the spectrum of the frame operator information. Um, okay, 
Now, um, when I first started going to frame theory talks, people would always talk about the grand matrix. And I was always like, what the hell? The grand matrix sucks. It's enormous. Um, why would you ever think about the grand matrix? It's, it's so big and scary. Um, and I've come around to the perspective that the grand matrix is good. Um, and one reason that it's good is that it contains both of these pieces of information that I said we might be interested in specifying sort of in one place, right? Um, so the grand matrix is, well, instead of getting sort of the little square matrix by multiplying the, 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 the short fat matrix by its conjugate transpose, um, multiplying the other order to get the big square matrix. And of course, it's gonna be Hermitian. So this, this scripty H is my, my notation for a Hermitian uh, matrix. Of, of whatever size. Um, so I get this gram matrix. It's of course, just like the matrix of inner products of the columns. And so in particular, like you see the squared norms of the, the frame vectors on the diagonal of the gram matrix. And then because um, F star F and FF star have the same rank and the same non-zero eigenvalues, well, if you've chosen the spectrum of FF star, you've basically also chosen the spectrum of F star F because it's just like, well, whatever that spectrum was and then a bunch of zeros. Um, so this is a place where you have both of these pieces of information in one location. Um, and then like, okay, well, given a frame, you get an associated gram matrix, but this map is like not injective. It's not really a faithful representation. Um, because if I had multiplied my frame by a little unitary, um, so I just applied some unitary trans, the same unitary transformation to all of the all of the frame vectors, all of the columns of the matrix, I would get the same gram matrix. Um, but conversely, if two frames have the same gram matrix, then they're actually related by a unitary transformation in this way. Um, and so we can think of gram matrices as sort of parameterizing unitary equivalence classes of frames. Um, and so um, that's, that's you know, a nice, simple um, fact that, it, that is going to be extremely useful for, for the things I wanna talk about. Um, okay, so now let's say we fix the spectrum of the frame operator. So lambda one through lambda d are the eigenvalues of the frame operator. Um, we, we can tack on a bunch of zeros and that will be the, um, the, eigen, the eigenvalues of the gram matrices of, of frames with that, with, um, you know, that spectrum of the frame operator. And then, so I, I fix you know, this, this collection of numbers, a bunch of which are zero, and then a bunch of which are, are positive numbers. Um, and then I can look at the conjugation orbits uh, of, of those things. So you know, just conjugate by unitaries, and you get all Hermitian matrices with the spectrum. And that's what I'm calling this O sub lambda. Um, so this is the or the conjugation orbit of you know the diagonal matrix with the right spectrum. So and of course it's just like the collection of the Hermitian matrices with with the correct spectrum. Um, and so these are all going to be gram matrices of frames with the, a given spectrum of the frame operator. Um, so this turns out to be a really nice space. It's called a flag manifold. Um, and so for example, like when the, the lambdas are all equal to each other, this is actually just a graph mon. So a, uh, this is the a space that parameterizes the d-dimensional subspaces of Rn or Cn, again, depending on, on which one we're in. Um, so, so that's a nice space. And so thinking in terms of gram matrices, you land from a differential geometric point of view, you land in these very nice spaces, which are, are the sorts of places where you actually want to do things. Um, okay, so that's just sort of pure differential geometry. Now let's talk about um, Lie groups a little bit. Um, so I, um, you know, I don't necessarily assume that everybody has really thought about Lie groups before. So what is a Lie group? Well, informally speaking, it's a group that's also a manifold. Um, and of course, what, what I mean by that is like, okay, well, you know, it's a manifold and then like there's a group operation and the group operations should be, you know, smooth maps, you know? Um, so, so if I take the product of two elements of the group, that's like a smooth map from the, you know, G cross G to G. Um, if I take the inverse of an element of the group, that should be a smooth map from G to G. Um, so that's, that's, you know, a Lie group. And then like, 
if you if you go back far enough in the literature, people talk about like continuous groups of symmetries or or whatever. So it's just like a group. I always you know you always want to think of a group as acting on a space, and it's like the collection of symmetries of the space. And here you have you know like a continuous group, um, really a smooth group. But anyway, um, okay. So what are some examples? Well. Um, you know, take your, your underlying vector space, Rn or Cn, it's a group under addition, then that group operation is nice. So, and these, these are sort of obviously manifolds. Um, a slightly less trivial, um, general linear groups are manifolds um, and they're also groups and so they're Lie groups. Um, special linear groups, again, they're manifolds, they're groups. Um, even a little bit, you know, so in compact groups, you know, the orthogonal group, special orthogonal group, unitary group, special unitary group. Um, and in low dimensions, these are often like spaces that you recognize like SO3 is diffeomorphic to the real projective three space. Um, SU2 is diffeomorphic to the, the three sphere. Um, so, so these are um, nice groups. Um, and then, you know, of course, if I take a product of two Lie groups, I get a new Lie. Um, and so like, um, we'll see tori at various points as, as we move ahead here. Um, and so tori are sort of nice examples of compact product groups. Um, I mean, in this case, they're a B lambda. Um, okay. Um, now, whenever you um, encounter, so the definition of Lie groups is like something that seems vaguely sensible. Um, and then, but then like whenever you take a course on Lie groups or even just encounter Lie groups, you know, somewhere or another, people almost immediately start talking about Lie algebras, which in some sense are, are way less intuitive to me at least. <laughs> um, and the reason is because like, well, if you're trying to classify Lie groups, it turns out that you, you can do so by classifying these things called Lie algebras, which are somehow easier in some sense because they're like linear objects, whereas groups are nonlinear. The Lie groups are nonlinear objects. Um, so again, just speaking informally here, the Lie algebra of a Lie group, one way to think about it is it's like the tangent space of the identity. Um, and so you say, okay, well, my group, like, you know, if you think about, you know, SO3 or, or SU2 is the three sphere. Well, the three sphere is like a nonlinear object, obviously, right? Um, but you're saying, okay, well, if I look sort of in, in the neighborhood of the identity and I sort of linearize everything, um, that's really what the Lie algebra is, um, in, in, at least in one interpretation. So it's, it's the tangent space of the identity. Um, and okay, I'll, I'll talk, it's, it's not, I mean, which is a, certainly a, a vector space, but of course it has this extra operation that makes it into a Lie algebra and not just like an arbitrary vector space, uh, which I'll mention in a second here. Um, but first, let's just talk about some, some um, examples. So if, if my Lie group is Rn, then it's Lie algebra is just Rn. Like from the identity, I can travel in any direction and you know, basically stay in um, Rn, uh, not surprisingly. Um, the Lie algebra of the general linear group is just all n by n matrices. Um, and the idea is like, well, from the identity, I can add like some small n by n matrix and I will still be invertible for a little while. Right? I have to travel a little ways away from the identity before I start getting to non-invertible things. Um, and so infinitesimally, I can uh, go in any direction whatsoever and stay within the general linear group. So the tangent space of identity is sort of all in by n matrices, not just the invertible ones. Um, if I um, look at the special linear group. So now I have this determinant condition. I'm saying like, okay, well now I'm only allowed to travel in directions from the identity that preserve the fact that the determinant is equal to one. Well, when you differentiate determinant in the appropriate way, what you get is trace. And so you're saying, well, if the determinant is not changing, that means the trace of the direction I'm traveling, you know, which I'm thinking of as an n by a matrix should be zero. Um, so the, the, the tangent space at the identity of the special linear groups are traceless matrices. Um, and the tracelessness is what preserves determinant as you travel in those directions. Um, for orthogonal groups and unitary groups, what you get are either skew symmetric or skew hermitian, depending on whether you're real or complex. And in the orthogonal case, of course, like skew symmetric matrices have zero on the diagonal, so they're automatically traceless. But in the unitary case, like you have um, purely imaginary numbers on the diagonal, 
And so to maintain determinant one in the special unitary case, that you know, needs to be traceless. So that's like an extra condition. Um, and let me just give you a, um, a, a more or less proof that um, this, is, this is the case, right? So, um, so uh, you know, an element of the tangent space of the identity, I can think of as just, well, it's the velocity vector of some path that passes through the identity at time zero. So I should just take you know, any path, call it gamma t, that passes through the identity at time zero. So I'm saying I take gamma t as a path in un, so the gamma zero is the identity. Now the defining equation for being in the unitary group is that like, well, your matrix times this conjugate transpose should be the identity. Um, so I equals gamma t gamma t star. So now differentiate this with respect to t and evaluate it t equals zero. So the derivative of the identity is zero because it's constant. And if you differentiate gamma t gamma t star, um, you, you use the product rule and then you remember, oh, but gamma zero is the identity. So this just ends up being gamma prime plus gamma prime star. So you're saying gamma prime plus gamma prime star is zero. So gamma prime, that's exactly saying that gamma prime at zero, which is your element of the tangent space is skew Hermitian because when you add it to its conjugate transpose, you get zero. Um, so anyway, it's, uh, maybe, it's, uh, maybe it's more obvious to people that the skew Hermitian things are the, the tangent space of the identity, but this is, this is more or less a proof of that fact. Um, I keep putting the wrong thing here. Um, okay, so what makes a Lie algebra a Lie algebra is that you have an, a binary operation, which is called the Lie bracket. Um, and, you know, when you first encounter this Lie bracket, it's always a little bit terrifying um, because, you know, another interpretation of Lie algebra is it's the left invariant vector fields on the group. And then this Lie bracket is like the Lie bracket on vector fields. And then, uh, you have to show that if I take the bracket of less invariant fields, I get a less invariant field and blah, blah, blah. And it's all kind of um, a little bit scary, I think. Um, but when you're dealing with matrix groups, which is all of the lead groups I'm gonna be talking about in this talk, um, the lead bracket is easy. It's just the commutator. So the bracket of A and B is AB minus BA. Like just, and the AB is like the, the product of matrices. Um, so, um, that's, um, that's, and so that's this, this sort of skew symmetric binary operation that, that turns a vector space into a Lie algebra. Um, all right, um, now, okay, so we have a, if you have a Lie group and you have a Lie algebra, um, and the idea is that the Lie algebra is sort of like the infinitesimal group elements, but then there's also an action of the group on the algebra on the Lie algebra, um, which is usually called the adjoint action or sometimes the adjoint representation of the group. Um, and so where does this come from? Well, the group acts on itself by conjugation, like all groups do this. And of course, um, conjugation fixes the identity, right? If, if H is the identity, then like GH, G inverse is still the identity. Um, so this is an action of the group, which is smooth because it's a Lie group. So, so everything inside is smooth. Um, it fixes the identity. And so now if you linearize, what it's saying is like, well, when you linearize, I get a, a map, a linear map from the tangent space of the identity to the tangent space of the identity. Um, but that's exactly the Lie algebra. So this gives you a, um, a, a linear map from the Lie algebra to itself, which is induced by this conjugation action of the group. Um, so that action is called the adjoint action, or again, sometimes the adjoint representation. Well, the adjoint, it's the adjoint representation of the group is sort of this action um, of linear automorphisms of the Lie algebra. Um, and again, like in general, you have to, you know, defining what this thing means is a little bit, of, or, you know, well, I mean, what I, what I said is literally what it is. You linearize the conjugation action, but then like you, you end up with various complicated sort of, or, I don't know, the notation gets a little bit annoying in my opinion, um, sometimes. Uh, I mean, there's a reason for it, but it's, um, for matrix groups, everything is fine. Like if I linearize the conjugation action, it's just the conjugation action. So we were just talking about, you know, conjugating elements of the Lie algebra um, when, when we're in the setting of matrix groups. Um, so just as an example, um, 
the Lie algebra of SO3 is the skew symmetric three by three matrices. Um, and so, of course, um, a skew symmetric three by three matrix, I can, I, with this sort of funny choice of where X, Y, and Z go and the signs, um, I can identify with a point in R3, the, the vector X, Y, Z. Um, it turns out that the, the, co the commutator on such matrices, um, I've chosen the positions of the X, Y, Zs and the positions of the minus signs exactly so that if I do the commutator of two of these matrices, it's you get exactly the same thing as if I had taken the cross product of the two vectors in R3. Um, so as Lie algebras, the, um, the Lie algebra of SO3 is isomorphic as Lie algebra to R3 with the cross product. So it's cross product turns out to satisfy the axioms of, of being a Lie bracket. Um, okay. Um, and now, so if I conjugate on, um, you know, such a skew symmetric three by three matrix by an element of SO3, like that is the thing that I'm calling the adjoint action. So let me just take the element of SO3, which is rotation by angle theta around the Z axis. Um, so then you just do this computation and, you know, blah, 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 whatever. Um, the, the point is to see, oh, well, I haven't changed the minus Z. Um, and what I've done to the X's and Y's is I've basically sort of rotated them. Um, like the Y turned into Y cos theta plus X sine theta. Um, the minus X turned into minus X cos theta plus Y sine theta. So all the, so this, this conjugation action, what it's doing is it's, you know, if I'm identifying the elements of little SO3 with an element of R3, that vector X, Y, Z, I'm just rotating this vector around the Z axis by angle theta. Um, and that's true more generally. If I take any element of, of capital SO3, the group, well, all, all SO3 elements are rotations. And if I now conjugate a skew symmetric matrix by some rotation, it's always just doing the rotation action. And so this adjoint representation of SO3 corresponds to just the usual representation of SO3 as rotations of R3. Um, so, and, and this is exactly why I've, again, chosen coordinates on the Lie algebra in this particular way. Um, so the, these actions are often, you know, fairly simple. Um, and, okay. Well, what, you know, thinking of that example, what are the orbits of that action? Well, if I take any vector and I apply all possible rotations, then I just get a sphere of whatever radius was the, the length of that vector, right? So if I start with a vector of, of, of norm R and then I apply all possible rotations, I get all points on the sphere of radius R centered at the origin. Um, so that's the orbit of that adjoint action of, of SO3 on its Lie algebra. Um, and then there's a general um, theorem that says that, well, the orbits of adjoint actions are symplectic manifolds. Um, and there's a caveat here because strictly speaking, the natural thing to do is to pass to the dual of the Lie algebra and talk about the co-adjoint action on the dual of the Lie algebra. And it's really the co-adjoint orbits that are naturally symplectic. Um, but if you choose a, an inner product, then you get an isomorphism between the Lie algebra and its dual. And so you, you know, um, anyway, in, in these, especially with compact groups, like, you know, th there's sort of an obvious choice of inner products. So um, anyway, uh, I don't, I don't want to deal so much with adjoint versus co-adjoint, but just, a, you know, more or less um, conjugation actions of matrix groups on their Lie algebras you know, you look at orbits of those things, what you get are always symplectic manifolds. So certainly in this case, like, what do you get? You get two spheres, two spheres are, are orientable, um, two manifolds, and so they're, they're um, naturally symplectic. Um, I'm also not really going to give a definition of symplectic, um, but just to say that they're particularly nice, even dimensional manifolds. Um, okay, so um, what does this have to do with frames? Well, remember I said, well, with um, frames, like you can talk about the Gram matrix, which is a, you know, either symmetric or Hermitian matrix. So if we're dealing with complex frames, the Gram matrix is gonna be a Hermitian matrix. Um, and if I take a Hermitian matrix and multiply it by I, I get a skew Hermitian matrix. Um, so, okay, um, but the skew Hermitian matrices are exactly the, the Lie algebra of unitary group. Um, 
And so if I talk about conjugation orbits of Hermitian matrices, so all the Hermitian matrices, and again, you know, think gram matrices with the same spectrum, well, that exactly corresponds to like a, an adjoint action of the unitary group on its Lie algebra. And so those things, the collections of gram matrices with fixed spectrum are going to be symplectic manifolds according to this sort of general principle. Um, and okay, so this is exactly the, the sort of, so I, I'm, I'm gonna okay. do one slide about Wait. symplectic, yeah. Are you saying you just pull the eye out to see the identification? Yeah, so I'm just saying that like the conjugation doesn't care about, you can pull the eye out of the conjugation. Yeah. So, yeah. Yep. Pretty exactly. slick. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so um, if you want to see a lot more about complexity geometry and frame theory, um, Tom Needham's talk from about a month ago was all about this. Um, I'm just going to devote one slide just to say that like symplectic geometry does cool stuff for you um, in frame theory. Um, so again, like if I look at the the, um, the the grand matrices of frames with fixed frame spectrum, um, then um, that is, you know, up to multiplication by i, one of these adjoint orbits, and therefore it's symplectic. Um, and then, you know, fact, the, the map which records the diagonal entries of a Hermitian matrix is the momentum, you know, what's called the momentum map of a Hamiltonian torus action. Um, that just, I mean, this is basically a way of saying this is a really nice group action from the perspective of symplectic geometry, and it has an associated map which records conserved points. Um, there's a theorem, well, if you like, well, yeah, it's really one theorem um, in some sense of a T and Gilman Sturming that says that momentum out of Hamiltonian torus actions have convex image and connected level sets. Um, so now if you apply this theorem to um, these particular orbits, what you get is this theorem that Tom and I proved in a paper that was published earlier this year, which says, okay, look at the space of frames where you fix the spectrum of the frame operator and you fix the norms of the frame vectors. Um, then that space is always path connected because the, you know, fixing the spectrum of the frame operator is, is choosing this O lambda, the, the collection of gram matrices with, with given spectrum. Um, the diagonal entries of the gram matrix are exactly the squared norms of the frame vectors. And so um, this map that records the diagonal entries is exactly just, so if I choose, you know, diagonal entries, I'm just looking at a level set of that map. Well, but there's a Tia goma theorem says that those level sets are always connected. So this tells you that the space of frames, complex frames with fixed frame spectrum and fix, fixed norms of the frame vectors is always path connected. Um, so this is, um, you know, uh, a generalization, oops, uh, of a, a theorem of um, Dustin and Jameson Cahill and Nate Strawn, which says that um, unit norm type frames, the space of those things is connected. Um, now they prove that for both real and complex, and this is only about complex, but it, it sort of generalizes to all possible frame spectra and all possible um, norms. Um, so it, it the point is, some like geometry gives you, in some sense, a very slick proof of that result. And in fact, a, a sort of, you know, pretty broad generalization of this frame homotopy theorem. Um, okay, um, fine. So that's it for symplectic geometry, really. But just to say that, like, you have, in, in this symplectic geometry world, you have all these nice tools, this Atiyah Goldman Sturming theorem and various other things um, that, that, that allow you to do pretty powerful things um, without a huge amount of effort. And again, if you want to see more, please see Tom Needham's talk from like a month ago. Um, okay, so um, so this is something I've known for a little while now, and it always kind of bugged me. I was like, that's great for complex things. Like there's this really nice correspondence between Hermitian matrices and skew Hermitian matrices, just multiply by I. Um, and, you know, from this perspective of like, you know, Lie groups and Lie algebras, the skew Hermitian things are the things you really like, but from the perspective of gram matrices, that the, the Hermitian things are the things that you like. Um, but you can easily go back and forth by just multiplying by I. Um, but like, what's the deal with like real frames? Because now your gram matrices are symmetric, 
but the Lie algebra that sort of naturally arises is the skew symmetric matrices. And like, okay, like just think about three by three matrices. So three by three symmetric matrices, that's like a six dimensional space. But the three by three skew symmetric matrices, that's a three dimensional space, right? Uh, like there's not going to be a good way to go back and forth between these spaces that are completely different dimensions, right? Um, so like, how how are you supposed to like try to generalize this whole symplectic geometry adjoint orbit blah 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 business? Um, because like it, they're not adjoint orbits. Like you know, gram matrices of real frames with fixed spectrum are just not adjoint orbits in any sensible way. Um, and likewise. Um, you know, so this came to my mind in late spring or yeah, late spring, early summer, somewhere in then, um, my graduate student asked me, uh, Colin Roberts is his name, by the way, um, asked me like, well, okay, you have this like generalized frame homotopy theorem for complex frames. What about like quaternionic frames? <laughs> um, and I was like, gee, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, but I was reminded actually of a talk that Emily gave in maybe February, um, where she was talking about some work with Dustin and Joey, um, where one of the things they, they thought about was like quaternionic stuff, let me just say. And, and in turn, um, that paper, I guess, was inspired in, at least in part by a talk that Bern Paulson gave, you know, a while back, again, in Codex. So this is all, <laughs> it's Codex all the way down, I guess is what I would say. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, so so okay, what's the deal with quaternionic things? Like maybe this trick kind of works in that setting, even though it doesn't work in the real setting. Um, so in 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 quaternionic land, the analog of the unitary group is called the, the symplectic group. Um, its Lie algebra consists of skew Hermitian quaternionic matrices. Um, but again, the dimensions are all wrong. Now you know, in in the real case, the the skew symmetric was sort of too small because you always have zeros on the diagonal in, in for skew symmetric, whereas the diagonals of symmetric things can be whatever real numbers you want them to be. Um, in complex case, there was like this perfect thing where it's like, well, for skew Hermitian, you have a purely imaginary diagonal. For Hermitian, you have real diagonal. And of course, you can go back and forth by multiplying by i. In the, in the quaternionic case, it's sort of the other way around. It's like, well, now the skew Hermitian are too big um, because, the diagonal still has to be purely imaginary, but now you have a three-dimensional space of purely imaginary quaternion. Um, whereas the Hermitian thing is the diagonal has to be real, so you 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 know that's sort of two dimensions smaller. Um, so now the the Hermitian things are sort of too small rather than too big. Um, and so yeah, there's just not a, yeah at least to me it's not obvious how to identify like you know gram matrices with fixed spectrum with like adjoint orbits in any way, you know, in this, in this sort of setup. Um, so, okay, Colin asked me this question. I said, huh, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know. Um, and then um, at some point I stumbled across this thing called the Cartan decomposition, which of course is old. Um, so, you know, I should have probably learned it in grad school or something, but I didn't. Um, so there's, okay, there's some definition which you can look up, which, you know, says like, well, if I have an involution of a Lie algebra, um, it's called a Cartan involution. If I form this, this bilinear form, which is like take the killing form, but then throw the involution in front of one of the terms, um, if that thing's positive definite, then it's gonna Cartan involution. Okay, I'm not gonna define what the killing form is. It kind of doesn't matter. Um, well, it, I mean, it matters, I guess, but it not, doesn't matter for what I'm gonna talk about. Um, so anyway, there's some formal definition, which is not a bit, you know, not something I'm gonna focus on too much. Here's an example. So I have traceless real n by n matrices. Um, I can define an involution by sending a matrix to minus its transpose. Um, and this is really like a linearization of an involution on, on the group, which is, defined by sending a, a matrix to the transpose of its inverse. So under the linearization, the inverse turns into a minus sign. The multiplicative inverse turns into an additive inverse. Um, okay. Um, so then um, it's an involution and it's invertible. Um, so its eigenvalues can only be plus or minus one. Um, so there's gonna be a plus one eigenspace and a minus one eigenspace. 
So the plus one eigenspace is usually called K um, in, this, in this world. Um, so uh, the plus one eigenspace are the things that are fixed by this involution. So you're saying that X is equal to minus X transpose. Well, those are the skew symmetric matrices, right? The minus one eigenspace are the things where, you know, um, minus X equals minus X transpose. So X equals to X transpose. So those are the symmetric matrices. And because we're in the, the space of traceless things, they have to be traceless symmetric matrices. Um, those eigenspaces are perpendicular. So I get this orthogonal decomposition of the Lie algebra into K plus P um, and such a decomposition and you know, because this involution satisfies um, the assumptions, um, it, it, so it's a Cartan involution, and this decomposition is called a Cartan decomposition. Um, and now, um, if it turns out, you can compute that. Uh, well, actually, it's it's easy by just looking at the fact that uh, eigenvalue minus one times eigenvalue plus one gives like one times minus one equals minus one. Um, if I take the bracket of something in K with something in P, I get something in P. Um, so this bracket is like the linearization of the conjugation action. So this is saying that like, okay, well, look, K is skew symmetric matrices. Um, that's the Lie algebra of the orthogonal group, the special orthogonal group in this case, because we determine it once. Um, so um, bracket KP contained in P tells me that if I conjugate something in P with something in SON, I end up back in P. So the action of SON on P by conjugation ends up back in P. Um, now this is like, this is something you know, like if I take a symmetric matrix and I conjugate it by a orthogonal matrix, I get back a symmetric matrix. Like this is in some sense, not new information. Um, but the point is that all of these things are true in general. Like um, I have any, okay. So I stated some theorem, which is, you know, but basically like, if you have a, uh, a lead group um, and there is such a Cartan decomposition, all these things happen. Like you, you get this orthogonal decomposition into K plus P. K is like the Lie algebra of some compact subgroup. Um, and that some compact subgroup acts on the, the orthogonal complement on the P by conjugation or by the adjoint action um, and, and it preserves it. Um, and then um, you can see that, oh, well, if G is non-compact and semi-simple, then G is really sort of the product of the, X, the matrix exponential of K times the matrix exponential of P. Um, this is, in this setting of SLN, this is basically just the polar decomposition. So what the, the Cartan decomposition, one way to think about it is like, it's a generalization of the polar decomposition to arbitrate semi-simple decrypts. Um, and then um, the other part of, of this theorem that I've just sort of stated is that, okay, well, I can take G, I can, I can mod out by K. Um, in general, if K is not normal, that's not gonna be a group, but it will be a manifold called a homogeneous space. Um, and then you can, you can think of K as being the, the isotropy subgroup of a point, for example, the identity. Um, isotropy meaning the, 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 the elements of, of, the, of G that fix these points and this quotient. Um, and it turns out that the, the you can you can think of the tangent space at the you know the, the equivalence class for the identity of this quotient as being diffeomorphic or you know isomorphic really to P. Um, and then the action of K on P corresponds to sort of the the ice the action of K thought of as the isotropy group of this point in this homogeneous space um, on the tangent space. And so okay, in some sense that doesn't really give you much if if you aren't a differential geometer, but um, I'm saying all this just to say that like you often, this adjoint action of K on P, which is guaranteed by this bracket condition um, is often called the isotropy representation of K. Um, and so in the literature, you often see isotropy representation, isotropy orbits, blah, blah, blah. So in our setting, we're just gonna say, look, we're gonna have you know a group. We're gonna have this compact subgroup called capital K. It's gonna act on sort of the orthogonal complement of its Lie algebra inside the big Lie algebra um, by conjugation because it's a matrix group. Um, and the orbits of that thing are gonna be called isotropy orbits. Um, and that action, you know, that representation of the group is called the isotropy representation. So this is just in the nature of explaining terminology really. Um, so Clay, yeah. um, before we pulled it I out, I guess now we're just passing to the orthogonal complement. And maybe that's the generalization. Yeah, so the, um, the multiplication by I is 
sends you to the orthogonal complement, right? Okay. Yeah. Got it. Thank so, you. so, and in fact, the 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 generalization of that is to say, if you have a compact Lie group and you take a complexification, um, then um, a Cartan decomposition of the Lie algebra of the complexification is into the Lie algebra of the group plus I times the Lie algebra of the group. Um, and then you get this identification between sort of adjoint orbits and isotropy orbits and, and everything. Um, yeah, so, so really it's like group and complexification. So in that case, the, you have the unitary group, it's complexification is GLMT. Um, all right, so then, okay. But in this setting of these isotropy, you know, representations and isotropy orbits and so on and so forth, um, you have some really powerful theorems. So the most famous one is this Costant's convexity theorem. So I have um, a, a Lie group um, with Cartan decomposition, um, you know, into K plus P. If I take a maximal abelian subspace of P, um, then, and then I, I, I can write down an orthogonal projection onto the maximal abelian subspace. So in the, in the example, just think P was like the Hermitian matrices or the symmetric matrices. A is going to be the diagonal matrix. Um, that's an, an abelian subspace of the of the symmetric matrices. Um, and then this P is just project, you know, just recording the diagonal entry. So that's something we've actually seen before. Um, and now if I take an isotropy orbit of a diagonal matrix, so something in this abelian subspace. So again, this is just a conjugation orbit of a diagonal matrix. So this is just going to be, you know, symmetric matrices with given spectrum. Um, then the um, this projection map where you, you take something in this orbit and you just record the diagonal entries is exactly equal to the convex hull of something. And what that thing is, it's like, well, there's this thing called the vial group that you can define um, and it acts on A and then you take the, you know, so A, if I think of A um, and I, yeah, I act by this, by this vial group, I get you know, some, collect, some finite collection of points and I take the convex hull and it, the image of an orbit under this projection map is exactly close to that convex hole. Um, so, um, so in the example, you have SLN, um, K is SUN, um, you know, little k is the skew Hermitian matrices, um, little p is the traceless Hermitian matrices, A is just a diagonal matrix, um, then the this OA is just going to be okay. Well, take this diagonal matrix and conjugate it by arbitrary, you know, elements of SUN. Um, and then you're saying, and, and it turns out that in this case, the vial group is the symmetric group, just acting by permuting entries and in, in A. Um, and so this says, well, the you know, the the image of the map which records diagonal entries of um, you know Hermitian matrices with fixed spectrum. Um, is the convex hull of the, you know, the um, collection of points you get by taking permutations of the spectrum, right? Well, you know, that, that's up to the fact that I'm taking SUN rather than UN. This is like the Scherhorn thing, right? Scherhorn says like, if I take Hermitian matrices with fixed spectrum and I, I record their diagonal entries, I get exactly um, the convex hull of the permutation orbit of the spectrum. Um, so this cosine convexity theorem is like this like mega generalization of Scherholm to arbitrary semi-simple Lie groups. Um, um, now the point is like you can play the same game with real or quaternionic matrices. Um, with real, you get you know, the real Scherholm theorem. Quaternionic, you get some sort of quaternionic Scherholm. Um, but the point is this is now a, a setting which um, you know sort of unifies complex, which seems special because of this sort of accident that multiplying by I took you from Hermitian to skew Hermitian, um, to see, oh, well, actually it's all sort of part of the same story. Um, so there, so that was one sort of cool theorem that shows up in these Cartan decompositions. Here's another one, this is due to Olivia Mare. Um, so this is saying, okay, well, under some additional technical assumptions, which I'm not gonna write down because they're um, annoying. Um, you you um, you can see that the uh, 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 the equivariant cohomology of the orbit surjects onto the equivariant cohomology of a level set, um, 
And okay, whatever the how equivariant cohomology means, in particular, if you look at sort of the H0 version of this, um, what this is going to tell you is that, well, if the, if, the, um, if the orbit is connected, then the level set is connected. Um, so now, again, think like um, in the setting of um, gram matrices, the orbit is like all gram matrices with a given spectrum. So this corresponds to unitary equivalent classes of frames with given spectrum of the frame operator. Um, this projection map is according to diagonal entries, which is the norms of the frame vectors. And so now you're saying like, well, if the orbit, so the collection of all gram matrices with given spectrum is connected, then the level set of this diagonal entries map are connected. So the collection of, of matrices with given spectrum and also given norms is connected. Um, so this gives sort of um, an alternative proof, if you like, of this generalized frame homotopy theorem for complex frames, um, which is pretty cool. So you, you can actually reprove the stuff that Tom and I did in that paper without any reference to symplectic geometry, just sort of pure Lie theory. Um, okay, so I wanna close by saying, okay, you can do stuff with quaternionic frames. Um, so um, actually, when should I end? We started a little bit late, but I'm happy to end um, on a reasonable time frame. At, at least in another five minutes, you could go. Okay, cool. Um, so let me just say, okay, People hopefully know more or less what quaternions are. You can, they're like a, a skew field on R4 that you can define. Um, this is a nice mnemonic for remembering that I times J is K, but J times I is minus K because when you do I times J, you're going with the arrows, but J times I, you're going against, so you pick up a minus sign. Um, it's just the, the projective line on F2 or something. Um, you can also realize quaternions if you think of, you know, um, instead of four real numbers, if you think of them as a pair of complex numbers, you can you can associate any quaternion with a two by two complex matrix. Um, and then, okay, so the quaternions are not really a field because they're not commutative, but they're a skew field. Um, and then if I think of sort of d-tuples of quaternions, I can think of that as basically a vector space, but now because of the non-commutativity, I would think about, well, is it a left vector space or a right vector space? And it turns out that I'm gonna think of it as a right vector space. Um, and then you can talk about frames and like all the things, like the definition is exactly the same because there's a, a quaternionic inner product. Um, you know, you can talk about frame operators, you can talk about gram matrices um, and, and you can see, you can show that, you know, well, gram matrices correspond to, a, you know, unitary equivalence classes where here and now the unitary group is really the symplectic group of, of, of um, of frames. Um, so um, please, so Shane Waldron has a nice paper where he sort of proves a lot of, um, you know, gives all of sort of the definitions and then also, you know, proves a lot of, you know, useful things about quaternionic frames. So that's, that's a good uh, thing to look at. Um, and then, you know, like people, you know, there's various, you know, places where people are, are using sort of quaternionic signals to record like orientation information or like um, multi-component seismic measurements or whatever. And so it's like, well, there's there's some version of like quaternionic um, signal processing that's that's starting to be developed. Um, and so that are, you know, um, there's some justification for why you would actually be doing this, this frame theory stuff, because it's like, well, I'll take your classical frame theory stuff, which is sort of signal processing and, and generalize to this quaternionic setting for quaternionic signals. Um, so now um, quaternionic matrices can be realized as complex matrices in exactly the way you know, that the quaternionic numbers can be realized as two by two um, complex matrices. Um, you do exactly the same trick. You say, well, my quaternionic matrix can be written as a complex matrix plus another one times J. Um, and so now split those up like this. Um, if you take the image under this map of the symplectic group, it's gonna land in the special unitary group. Um, and it's, you know, you can define it as exactly the six point set of this involution, um, omega star U bar omega, where omega is this symplectic form matrix um, with this two, you know, this block um, two by two with I's and sort of the off diagonal blocks. Um, so this is an involution. It turns out to give you a Cartan involution, the corresponding Cartan decomposition of the Lie algebra. Um, basically, you know, you get a K and a P, and K is basically, you know, the Lie algebra of the symplectic group, and P um, under this, this identification is exactly the traceless Hermitian 
um, quaternionic matrices. Um, and so, so that again, you see like the Hermitian things are sort of showing up as the orthogonal complement of the skew Hermitian things in, in this setting. Um, so now we can talk about, okay, well, you know, quaternionic frames with, you know, you fix the spectrum of the frame operator and the norms of the frame vectors. Um, fixing the spectrum of the frame operator gives you a particular um, conjugation orbit. Um, so, you know, you, you, you're fixing the, the, the spectrum of these big Hermitian matrices. Um, so again, that's just gonna be this O lambda. And the point is like, well, now if, if I look in O lambda, um, and I and I record the diagonal entries. Well, that's that's you know that's exactly telling me the norms of the frame vectors, and then this cosine convexity theorem, you know, tells you well what is the image of that map recording the diagonal entry, um, and so it's the convex hull of the of the permutation orbit of the spectrum of the gram matrices. Um, so that tells you exactly when you can have those um, norms of the frame vectors. Um, and, and this is, I just point out, this is exactly the same admissibility criterion as for real and complex frames. Um, so this is, you can see, for example, this in, in Kassos and Leon's paper. Um, so you might think, oh, well, like by going from, from complex to quaternionic, maybe I could get, you know, um, frames, um, you know, with where I have more, you know, freedom to choose the norms of the vectors by sort of passing it quite quaternionic. And the answer is, well, no, you, you don't get any more freedom than you already had even in the real case. Um, so that basically boils down to Kostan's convexity theorem. And then um, there's also a generalized frame homotopy theorem, which says that, well, these spaces are always path connected. Um, again, because like, well, you can just see them more or less as level sets of this map, but Mara's theorem tells you that level sets are connected. Um, and so there's some games you have to play in terms of making sure that the technical hypothesis are satisfied and like, oh, well, there was traceless emission, but we don't just want to restrict the traceless. And so there are a few sort of technical details, but the key, the key ideas are, are very you know, straightforward, I think. Um, so let me just close by sort of putting a list of questions on the screen. Um, and maybe I'll just say a couple words. So um, these isotropy orbits are examples. Uh, so in the real case, um, they don't satisfy the technical hypotheses. Um, so you can't say that the spaces are connected. In fact, some of them are not connected, um, but you know, is it possible to characterize which lambdas and which R's lead to connectedness and which lead to disconnectedness is I think you know, an open question. Um, um, these isotropy orbits are examples of what are called isoparametric submanifolds. Um, and um, which is sort of a Ramanian geometry thing. Um, so in the case of complex, you know, unit room type frames, what Tom talked about was talking about like getting a handle on the, on the, the measure on these things from a symplectic geometry point of view. Um, I think it's, it's, you know, an interesting question whether this sort of isoparametric like submanifold Ramanian geometry perspective gives you any insight into, um, you know, the natural sort of you know, Hausdorff measure on the spaces of real or quaternionic unit norm type frames. Uh, I mean, obviously real would be probably the most interesting, um, but it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tool that's not just like doing Hausdorff measure from scratch. Um, and then, um, you know, for quaternionic frames, I, I think there should be sort of a version of the eigenstep method for constructing them. Um, so, you know, it would be interesting to, to um, see that that's really the case. Um, and then this is again sort of a question that Colin, the graduate student, originally asked me, um, which is like, okay, well, you can do real, you can do complex, you can do quaternionic. Um, is there a, um, you know, these are these are all sort of the really nice examples of Clifford algebras. And so this is just a question for anybody. I have no idea. Like, is there any reasonable notion of like frames in Clifford algebra? Um, That's it, thank you. All right, um, let's thank Clay for that really interesting talk. If you want to, uh, as my co-organizers say, say, smash that reaction button. 